Do we have too much government? We need to put uh, people in ahead of corporate profits. This system is so lopsided. This threat is a real threat to democracy. And I think that's really important. That's something we haven't been doing in this country for a long time. Where do you start? What do you do? How do you do it? Access to Democracy and other Egan Community Television programming is supported by Thomson Reuters, makers of Westlaw Next and based in Egan. Through Westlaw Next and other innovative online services, Thomson Reuters is the world's leading source of intelligent information for businesses and professionals. Online at ThomsonReuters.com and by U.S. Federal Credit Union the member-owned financial institution offering service, value, and experience you can trust to the greater Twin Cities community. Welcome. Access to Democracy returns with a guest that I've actually been trying to get here for a number of years. And when you see the face of Professor David Schultz, you will immediately recognize him. Uh, people might not know his name. I know when I walk around the community now, and even as far away as, as the airport in Houston once, somebody came up to me and said, you're the television guy. And uh, David Schultz has more degrees than a thermometer. <laughs> he, he is so prolific. He is an expert in so many fields. He teaches at Hamlin University. He teaches at several law schools. Uh, you see him all the time on television. If it's not WCCO, it's CNN, or uh, who knows what. And it's a pleasure to finally get you here. And it's a pleasure to be here. Thank you very much for having me today. No, our pleasure. I hope this is the first of many visits. I, do, I hope so, too. Good. Now, <clears throat> you have a new book out. And uh, we'll show it on the screen in a few minutes. But uh, American politics in the age of ignorance, which is interesting. But let's talk about some of the fascinating chapters. And there's a couple of things we have to talk about. We have to talk about pull tabs, right. which you've had an article about recently. Uh, we have to talk about one that you had yesterday, the power of the Supreme Court based on the uh, same-sex marriage cases, but let's talk about the book. Chapter 2, taxes. They don't matter much. They don't, and that's one of the great myths. I mean, let's say a couple things first about the book. What the book, the title, American Politics in the Age of Ignorance, it's not about what the public doesn't know. It's about what legislators and policymakers don't know. It's about how they make decisions sometimes completely ignorant of the facts. And, and, and I put together in the book a list of, like my top 10 list of political myths or failed public policy ideas, and at the top of my list is the one that's all about taxes. And specifically, there is this myth that somehow taxes are the single most important factor affecting economic development, affecting business location decisions, and the truth of the matter is, taxes come in, especially with location decisions, at about fifth or sixth on the list. And think about it, that the most important factor that really affects businesses is labor force issues. Then it comes down to transportation, energy costs, access to suppliers, access to consumers. Then you get down to taxes. And we hear about taxes as a predominant issue all the time. And we hear about the fact of the trickle-down theory which is so important to our economy, which I haven't believed since Reagan first came out with it. Right. Uh, but I don't know what your take is on it. Well, uh, th I, I exactly agree with you. There, there is <coughs> no evidence, absolutely no evidence, that taxes are a major determinant of, of economic growth or of, or of employment or anything along that score. And there are literally hundreds of credible studies that point to that fact. But more importantly, if we just look at the U.S. economy over about an, an 80 or 90 year period, and I, and I marshal a lot of data to point this out, is that in the 1960s, for example, where the top corporate tax rates were double of what they are now, if not more, where the top 
personal income tax rates were up in the 60 to 70 percentile range. The U.S. economy grew more rapidly and generated more jobs in eras of higher taxes than it has done in the last 20 to 30 years since the Reagan era with dramatically lower taxes. There's just no connection between taxes, employment, and economic growth. And at that time, the average worker was not getting only one three hundredth of the, what the top CEOs are getting. Somehow or other, the disparity that has moved since the 60s to where average salaries have gone down if you factor in mm. uh, certainly inflation, CEOs' salaries and golden parachutes and things like that have gone off the wall. In fact, one of the things I wanted to talk to you about is how can I get a job coaching at the University of Minnesota because I would like to get fired and have a $2.5 million payout. Yeah. Yeah, you're absolutely right. Tubby's, Tubby's getting more in a payout than most people make in their entire lifetime. But no, you're absolutely right. That if we go back to the 1960s, and I can't think of what the exact ratio is at this point, but the, the ratio between the top CEO salary and an average worker was about 25 or 30 to 1. Now it's well over 300, 300 if not plus to 1 at this point. What we've seen is this explosion in terms of salaries at the top. And just since 1977, and again, there's several studies that point to this. Since 1977, for those in the top income level, their income has gone up nearly 300% from 1977 to 2007. Whereas for middle class America, it's, it's only about a 50% increase. For those at the poorest level, barely 18%. Wages have essentially stagnated in the last 30 years. It, for, for, for most of America, for the, the richest, it's, it's exploded. And so what the United States has now is one of the greatest gaps in income inequality in the world, clearly one of the greatest gaps in terms of, um, of, of wealthy, in terms of wealth and income since the 1920s. And for everybody who likes to think that the United States is the land of economic opportunity, where anybody can grow up and become rich, we have essentially stagnated in terms of economic mobility. Countries such as Great Britain, Sweden, most of Europe have far greater mobility than we do. We essentially, if you were born poor in the United States, the odds are you're going to stay poor. Unless you're a 17 year old in Britain who comes up with some kind of a program that Facebook is going to buy for $30 million. Ex but, uh, exactly, you're right. And, and, and that's what gives people hope, that, 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 that lottery mentality. But the reality is, the clear reality is, is that we do have a class stratification in the United States. We have, again, rich and people stay rich and they pass that on to their children. And we have poor and people generally stay poor in the United States. And it's getting worse. And it's getting worse. And and that's dangerous for a democracy because we are seeing clearly that separation into rich and to poor, a shrinking middle class, and very little opportunity to move from the from the lower class up into sort of the you know up into the middle income or to become rich. You know, I saw Mitt Romney on television yesterday, and he said one benefit of losing the election and he has the opportunity now to have a lot of free time and to go shopping and walk into the supermarket on his own and just walk up and down the aisles and i wanted to put my finger down my throat mm -hmm. because i think mitt romney other than posing for a campaign doesn't know the inside of a supermarket and doesn't have to nor to his children, speaking of being rich and staying rich. I think you're right. I think one of, you know, one of my um, all-time favorite scenes in presidential politics goes back to, I think it was 1992, and the first George Bush was running for re-election for president, and he went into a supermarket and had never seen a Scantron before, you know, where you, you know, the barcode, right. and he, I think it was a quart of milk he ran across it, and the price lights up, and he had the deer in the headlights look on his face, and he did it three, three or four more times. And people said, hey, George, you're a little out of touch with average America. And same thing with Mitt Romney. I mean, everybody remembers Mitt Romney's 47% speech. But, and everybody remembers him saying, I'll bet, was it Governor Perry, $10,000. But to me, the 
the statement of Ron that most showed how out of touch he was were, were two of them. One was when he told a bunch of students and saying, well, you should start your own business. And they said, well, how do I start my own business? He said, borrow money from your parents. Right, right. But the other one was he was in Detroit speaking to, I think, auto workers and talking about how hard things were and lamented the fact that of the four cars they owned, um, his wife um, only had two Cadillacs. Um, somehow that shows you how out of touch he was and how out of touch corporate America and many politicians are in the United States. Where he was building a garage with an elevator in it because they had more cars than they could store on the property. Yeah, they had to stack them. Yeah. This is, uh, you know, unbelievable. Uh, Scott, maybe you can focus on the book because we're talking about uh, American politics in the age of ignorance and, and what flows from it. Chapter three, welfare for professional sports. Yes. And we already talked about Tubby Smith. Yes. He's getting a two and a half million dollar buyout. And I see some of this, I, I read in today's paper that the salaries of the twins, which are now in the 80 millions, it used to be 120 million when they wanted a stadium, but now it's 80 million. 47% uh, of their salaries are taken up with Joe Maurer and Justin Morneau, mm -hmm. both really good ball players, uh, both people I admire, but their salaries are so disproportionate to really uh, what people are enduring in our society, and that goes for a lot of these, these ball players and all. So when you say welfare for professional sports, are you talking about building stadiums and uh, such as, well, let's get into pull tabs and, bu and sure. building well, stadiums well, well, right well, now. Well, well, let's first start with the welfare issue because <clears throat> one of the great myths, uh, one of the great myths is that somehow building a professional sports stadium is a great tool for economic development that's going to produce jobs, it's going to be great for the economy, and that's how it was sold. That's how the Viking Stadium was sold, as was the Twin Stadium sold to Minnesotans, saying this is a great economic engine for the area. Again, Overwhelming evidence, uh, and not just in my book, but overwhelming studies over the years have pointed out that public subsidies for sports is one of the worst investments a government can make in terms of helping the economy. That dollar for dollar, you could spend that money much better in terms of doing other things, in terms of job development, in terms of all different kind of ways of Maybe up, educating, educating college students educating, cheaper. Educating college students cheaper. You could do a ton of other things. I always like to tell people, if you don't believe my statistics, I always ask people, Go down to where the Metrodome is right now and walk around and ask yourself, what's the best economic development, what's the most viable um, economic enterprise down there? It's Hubie's Bar and Grill. That's it. A fine bar, but the point is, is that's typical of most stadiums around the country. You have nothing happening around it. And so the welfare for the rich, sports fair as I call it, is really when we provide public subsidies for a private business that is professional sports in order to enhance their profits, not to enhance the, eco the economy of, of the local area. And that's what we did with the Twins, and that's what we did with the Vikings. And now what we're finding out is that the entire premise for how we did the Vikings stadium is a complete, complete lie. I don't know how anybody believed that they were going to generate $300 million in electronic pull tabs mm -hmm. uh, over a period of time, but that it was going to then pay for $150 million worth of stadium. Uh, you've got Ziggy Wolf, who wants to turn it into a complex, as they have done in several places mm -hmm. around the country, including the one that just opened in Brooklyn, right. where it's not just a stadium, but it's a, it's a hotel, it's everything else. Uh, how possibly did the legislators not know this, or really, in, in truth, they really did and just shut their eyes? I don't know which is. I don't know what's worse, that they knew <clears throat> and shut their eyes, or they were willfully blind to what was going on. But in either case, what they did was to come up with an estimate about the pull tabs as a way of trying to convince the public and say, we're not spending public money on it. Because you might recall, Public opinion was pretty firm in saying no public tax dollars are going to go for the stadium. Um, and what happened here is that Ziggy Wolf invested well. I pointed this out in a couple of pieces about a year ago. Ziggy Wolf and the Vikings spent over about a six year period in excess of five to six million dollars lobbying the state legislature to try to push, push for a stadium. That's a great investment, five million dollars to get the money that they got. And it was pressure politics 
at the, at the legislature. The governor said, I want this to happen, and it happened, and I think they just turned a blind eye to absolutely everything simply because they wanted this to happen no matter what, and the numbers on the pull tabs were literally made up, made up by, um, by the gambling vendors who said this is what they want, and nobody along the line checked to really think that this was realistic in terms of the revenue they could generate. And so now, we're stuck. We're stuck because in that legislation, there was a backup that said that if the pull tab revenues didn't generate the money they were supposed to, we would still be on, on the hook for paying for the stadium. So now we're going to be on the hook. Which is even worse. Who, who drew that contract is a good question. Yeah. Uh, and Ziggy Wolf is not coming forward, who could easily uh, to make up the difference, but he's not going to do it now. He's, he's going to look to the state, and the state, which is just starting to pull itself out of really, really uh, deep debt, is going to be on the hook. Yep, yeah, because of that he, money. Because he's going to be able to enforce that contract and say that <clears throat> this is what you promised me and this is what I have to do, and it'll be legally enforceable um, in, in court. Now, th this, is, this is just making, this is the pull tab debacle, is just making a bad deal even worse. Because this was sold to the state as saying that Ziggy Wolf was going to put up, what, like three or four hundred million dollars. Ziggy Wolf's actual real contribution to the stadium is thirty six million dollars. That's it, because Joe Sushri did a great piece about this about a year ago that pointed out that Ziggy Wolf puts up thirty-six million. The NFL and their stadium construction funds and in their and sort of their their their, pro, their, their funding system. I remember the is, article. Is putting up the rest of it, and so Ziggy Wolf thirty-six million out of his own pocket, five million for lobbying the state of Minnesota, forty-one million dollars. He gets a billion-dollar stadium. I don't know about you, but I wish I could get that kind of return on my investment. He did really well. There's no question, and the fact of the matter is that the Metrodome which is a location which is feared by other teams because of the noise it generates and all, is only 30 years old. Right. It's not as though it's archaic. They could have taken, I think the estimate was 100 or 150 million and modernized it to the degree where it had wider aisles and things like that and certainly was usable. Mm -hmm. I look at the Carrier Dome in Syracuse, which is probably 40 years old and it's still a great venue with an inflatable roof. The, there is no difference and you know it's just another one of those situations uh, and I'm a Twins fan and I love the Twins. We do a lot with the Twins on this show but there comes a point where the people and the population have to predominate over the needs of sports athletes and that's why that chapter is a great chapter. Yeah, I mean, th I, mean th I mean, just think about it at this point. We still owe K through 12 not quite a billion dollars in terms of the, the budget settlement for a couple of years ago. Um, we are giving money to billionaires ahead of our K through 12, ahead of our students. We have robbed higher education in the state of Minnesota for years, but yet we can give money to billionaires. It's really a question about priorities at and this point. And it's not just here. Yeah, it's if across the country. Look, if we look at where our standing is yeah. in the world, educationally, uh, in terms of statistically, where the United States used to be in the forefront mm -hmm. constantly. Now we're 21st in, in math and 26th in science and, and whatever it is. And these other countries, which are a lot of them giving free education mm -hmm. and higher education, are moving ahead of us. What does that say for us in the future? Well, it's, well, it says two things. First, right now, it says something about priorities. But two, it says something about exactly where the future of our society is going to be. Because the single best investment we can make from an economic, cultural, whatever point of view is investing in education. That's, and I'm not just saying because I'm an educator. That's actually been documented. And that's about an investment in the future. And I don't think of spending money on education as being a liability. I draw the analogy to saying that when people buy houses, for example, it's an investment. Usually it's a good investment. But when you invest in education, you're putting money down now with returns that are going to come back many full times in the future. And again, we've robbed our schools, including in Minnesota, because think about it, even in Minnesota, we used to have you know, the, you know, the premier you know, educational system. Um, K through 12 in the United States, and we've slipped. I mean, where we slip badly now, especially, is in our racial disparities. We've got huge racial disparities in terms of our outcomes at this point, um, and we really need to be putting resources into um, the state. I think Rudy Perpich got it right 
back in the 80s when he said the gateway to Minnesota's success is to be the brain power state. That's exactly the right argument. And that's still where we should be. And Steve just signed him up to come in here, uh, I think next month, as a matter of fact, to talk about debt and uh -huh. finances in the state of Minnesota. Terrific. So, uh, and we only, we're going through time and we have so many topics to talk about. Democracy is the worst form of government, chapter six. Yes. So that's gotta be a provocative title. Uh, yes, yes. And it's about, it's a, that, that chapter is about two myths. Myth number one, that voter fraud is a serious problem affecting the outcome of elections in the United States. And then the second topic in that chapter is all about term limits. And let's talk about both of them. In terms of voter fraud. Well, we did get one 83-year-old woman we, we who, did. who we, made a mistake and voted absentee. That's right. How many millions did we spend talking about it in the legislature? Oh, we, Phenomenal amounts. Phenomenal Unbelievable. Amounts. Absolutely right. I mean, I point out to people, I went to the National Weather Service website once. The chances of any of us being struck by lightning is roughly one out of 800,000. The chances of, of voter fraud affecting the outcome of an election in the United States is around, I think it's six out of 153 million. It's about at the range of your chances of winning Powerball. There is almost no evidence that, that in-person voter fraud is a serious problem, yet Minnesota last year almost passed of a constitutional amendment based upon this myth, and many places across the country have restricted voting rights on this belief. And that's what they're really trying to do, is yeah. restrict voting rights to keep minorities away from the polls, to make it more difficult for people who generally vote of a liberal persuasion right. to get to the polls. Yes. Uh, there, are, there are people uh, on the right who have said, we've got to tighten up our voting to keep these people away. Yes. It's, that goes along with the elitist society that we're creating, and that's a very dangerous thing. It is. It's not only make, making sure <clears throat> that the economic elites do well, but it's to try to insulate them by preventing people to vote them out of office. I mean, I've described what's been going on for the last 20 years in terms of voter fraud, um, in terms of um, what we saw in Florida this past year, closing some polling places so you have really long lines. This is about the second great disenfranchisement in American history. The first great one was after the Civil War, after Reconstruction ended, the Jim Crow era, keeping f African Americans from voting. Now it's the same battle all over again. And that's what the chapter is about. It's about the, the, this great disenfranchisement, but it's also the chapter all about term limits. And it's, it's to point out that term limits have largely failed in terms of what they were supposed to do. If the belief was it was going to cut down on career politicians and sever the links between special interests and government, it done not, it has not done that at all. And in fact, it's increased the strength of special interests and corporate interests um, in, in the role of our political process. Well, look at England and how they handle an election and look at here and how we handle an election. Look at lobbyists writing actual legislation, which is being, a, and you know, look at Alec. Yes. Alec wrote legislation all over the country of a very restrictive nature. Uh, and I don't know if they're still doing it. They but are. We had a few people who uh, really exposed them for what they are. Yeah. Uh, but most of the population is not tuned into what's going on, unfortunately. Yeah, I, I've sometimes described the role of <laughs> lobbyists um, and what our government has become as the new feudalism. And what I mean by that, I remember once in a class once, a teacher said the definition of medieval feudalism was public power in private hands. That's what we have now. We have significantly taken public power and given it over to private, unaccountable lobbyists, um, to, to big corporations, especially after Citizens United, um, and they're able to dramatically call the shots. That's not a democracy. That's, that's government for the few, government for the rich. And uh, nice, depressing discussion. <laughs> Unfortunately, it's depressing. <laughs> it is. Here. It is. But it is all contained in American politics in the age of ignorance, and it's a book that is available now, if I'm not mistaken, it at, is Amazon, at, at Amazon. At and Amazon, at Barnes Amazon, and Noble. Barnes and Noble, and mm. hopefully if you go into your bookstore, you can ask them to order it for you also. Mm. I'm sure Common Good Books also must have it. Yes. That's, uh, yeah. And uh, I have one that's about four weeks away from, as a book about a dog. Okay. Do you have a pet? I have two cats and a bird. Oh, okay, well, a dog book may, but I love dogs. Okay, right. it's about my uh, 
my ex-dog, uh, uh -huh. who died in the summer of 2011. And after he died, I found that he had kept a journal of his whole life. Oh, really? That's probably so, good. So I transcribed the journal uh -huh. into My Name Was Toby, and the book is a few weeks away from coming out. Okay. Uh, we, we've had early copies here yeah. a couple of times, but uh, I knew you were bringing this one in today, and this is a book of substance. That's a book of fun. Yeah. Uh, in any event, we have gone through so much. Uh, let's talk about uh, the Supreme Court and gay marriage. Yes. Uh, what's going to happen there in these two momentous cases this week? Okay, I'll tell you what's probably not going to happen. What's not going to happen is what mm -hmm. supporters of gay rights most hope will happen, which is the court will use one of those two decisions to basically strike down as unconstitutional bans on, on, on same-sex marriage across the United States. Mm -hmm. That seems unlikely. What I think the most likely scenario is We'll do both cases first. The Proposition 8 case out of California, the court seems bent out of shape by the idea that they even took the case. They're, they're upset by the fact that the state of California opted not to defend Prop 8, but a private party did. So what, it's a question of w whether you have standing. jurisdiction. Jurisdiction, standing, standing. Right. So what I think is going to happen is the court is probably going to throw, um, say, we don't want to hear, it. We, we shouldn't have taken this case. The upshot is it'll mean that Proposition 8 will still be um, thrown out as unconstitutional because of the Ninth Circuit Court of Appeals declared it. In terms of DOMA, it also looks like DOMA, this is the Defense of Marriage Act, which prevents the federal government from recognizing a benefits, recognizing same-sex couples um, at the state level and then granting them federal benefits. That looks like that too is going to fall, and whether it's going to fall because either there is, again, no jurisdiction, or because Anthony Kennedy seemed to suggest that this is intruding on states' rights, intruding on states' rights to do things. But in either case, what we're going to probably see is victories in both of those cases for, for gay rights falling a little bit short at this point of actually the five votes that are probably necessary to strike down bans on same-sex marriage. Well, the court doesn't want to be on the wrong side of history, right. so they're going to be careful. Right. I, I think Scalia doesn't care which side of history he's on. That's right. Uh, and Thomas yeah. will Tom, follow Thomas him. is in his own history. But yeah. Thomas, interestingly enough, 30 years ago, couldn't have married the wife that he has married That's right. uh, with some of the restrictions, state restrictions on this. So I'm not sure how he's going to go. Yeah. But uh, I think you're dead right on this, and it's going to be really interesting. Yeah. And actually, we're coming up on only a minute left. I have so many things I want to talk to you about. You're obviously going to have to come back here soon. I have to come and, back. This uh, has been oh, enjoyable, yes. Oh, uh, we, we've got to continue this. Uh, you see some of our interviews with uh, Paul Anderson, mm -hmm. and uh, it would be great to get you and Paul here at the same time and really have a forum because yeah. we could have a ball. Let's focus on the book going out. Uh, the book is on the book stands now, American Politics in the, <coughs> in the Age of Ignorance, and that's the age, unfortunately, that we're in. And there it is, and uh, this is one must-buy book. And David Schultz, thank you so much for coming in and sharing with us, and we're going to continue this because it's been really an energetic and invigorating uh, interview, and I really appreciate you taking the time. My pleasure. Thank you for having me. Well, thank you. We've actually... Thank you.